Hello and welcome to another edition of Yakety Yak. I'm Andrew Young, the Chief Executive Officer of the Centre for Social Impact. Tonight's guest is Matthew Quinn. Matthew joined Stockland in 1999 and became Managing Director the next year. He's been President of the Property Council of Australia and in 2007 was made Chair of the Australian Business and Community Network. Besides those things, I'm particularly interested tonight to hear Matthew's perspective on Stockland in two contexts. The first is the hot topic of Australia's affordable housing crisis and the second is Stockland's grappling with the notion of being a creating shared value company. Demonstrating shared value tonight, Stockland are also hosting, so our thanks to them and welcome to our interviewer as always, Peter Thompson. Thanks Andrew. Matthew, welcome to Yakety Yak. Thanks Peter, pleasure to be at Yakety Yak. Now, a few giants of the Australian property business, Frank Lowy, Dick Dusseldorp and Irvin Graff, all came from Europe post-war. Uh, Irvin Graff, in the case of Stockland, um, didn't come as a refugee, he came as a free migrant. So tell us about uh, what he had in mind, what was his vision? Well, he, uh, he came as a free migrant from uh, Hungary after the war. We all know the, uh, the troubles that that country was going through at the time. Uh, he was uh, Jewish and uh, I never knew what he'd been through in his earlier life uh, because of his religion, but uh, I can imagine it was quite traumatic. Uh, but he uh, came here after the war uh, in about 1950. Uh, and uh, interestingly, migration was uh, a big part of Australia's population growth at that stage, but it was very skills-based and very focused. Uh, he was a, uh, an architect by qualification, I think, from Vienna University. So he applied to come to Australia as an architect, uh, but Australia wasn't looking for architects at that stage, so he got rejected and uh, went back and uh, reapplied as a bricklayer and got in. Uh, so probably a little bit of a parallel to what's going on uh, today because we certainly have a shortage of uh, potential shortage of bricklayers as the population uh, ages and there's less people come into the, uh, into the trades. And uh, his vision uh, when he came here was to use his skills and to uh, build an organisation I think ultimately uh, on the back of those skills. Uh, so it was property related. Uh, but he actually started off in 1952, I think from memory, uh, building what was Australia's first project home at that time, which is still standing. Where's that? Uh, Sefton, Western Sydney. Uh, it's probably got asbestos in it. Uh, <laughs> under control. Probably obviously. riddled with asbestos. <laughs> under control. Um, but that was, his dream was to actually provide housing for uh, post-World War II migrants that was uh, affordable and to use the profits that came from housing <coughs> to build an investment portfolio based on, uh, on retail shopping centres at the time. And at a later stage, he took over what was the least valued uh, company on the Australian share market. Uh, he did. I think it was called Stocks and Holdings. And uh, when we have our annual general meeting, uh, in fact, it was listed in 1958. And when we have our annual general meeting each year, uh, this lovely old shareholder comes along who uh, bought his shares I think about a year <laughs> after then for uh, a few shillings and sixpence. Uh, I'm not sure what his compound total return has been but uh, he seems happy enough. Uh, so did he have a social vision? Well he did and I thought I'd, uh, we're actually uh, coming up to the company's 60th anniversary. Uh, I think it was listed in 1952. Uh, so this is our 60th anniversary and uh, we're doing a 60th anniversary book and talking to people uh, from the past, Irvin's family, uh, his, his son Michael, who's uh, kindly contributed, uh, wonderful family, uh, plus also some of the people who've been associated with the company over many years. And uh, it's quite interesting because the young lady who's putting it all together is trying to grapple with the fact that everybody has a different version of history, uh, so trying to get one source of that will be quite interesting. <coughs> but uh, in, in doing our research, we actually found the 30-year anniversary book in uh, 1982. Uh, lots of uh, big wide ties, flared <laughs> trousers and that kind of thing in the photographs. But uh, I thought I would read Irvin's uh, quote in the introduction from the 1982 30th anniversary. And it goes, uh, it, it is with understandable pride that I reflect on our endeavours and accomplishments. The same professionalism which produced our past growth will produce our future growth. 
the same imaginative planning and community awareness which has been a contributing factor to Australians achieving a better living standard will continue. And we could paraphrase that, change the language, modernise the language, bit of today's jargon, and that would basically be the quote that we would have in our 60th anniversary book. Uh, our purpose as an organisation is to create a better way to live. Well, he's also quoted as saying that Stockland should not merely achieve growth and profits, but make a worthwhile contribution to the development of our cities and great country. Absolutely. So I mean, what he was very proud of that. What did he mean by that? <coughs> uh, I think fundamentally it was leaving the place a better place than when he found it. And that was certainly the philosophy that he had, the philosophy that his successor, Peter Daly, had, and the philosophy that I have. And the company's only had three chief executives in its uh, 60 years, really. So um, we all carry the torch on and, uh, uh, and do it in different ways, but I think with the same vision, but not necessarily realising that that was the case. So we'll talk about that philosophy in action as we proceed in our conversation, but you too are a migrant from the UK. What Indeed. brought you here? Well, it wasn't bricklaying. <laughs> uh, no, I think the, uh, I, we were 25 when we moved to Australia in 1987. We came here just before the 1987 stock market crash, which was a mere blip on the landscape compared <coughs> with what we've been through in the last few years. Uh, we were 25 years old, had our first child on the way, and you I came as a chartered accountant. I did, yes. Yeah. So I trained with, uh, I did chemistry at university, then uh, went into finance, trained as a chartered accountant with Price Waterhouse, came here with them on a two-year contract and left after... Explain the months. link between chemistry and chartered accounting. Well, interestingly, it's, it's one which is, uh, I think, very important because one of the philosophies of the, the professional firms in England, and I think that, that is still the case, is they actually wanted to recruit people from outside finance, people who hadn't done accounting at university. And one of the bugbears I have with the Australian education system is that people are put into a funnel at the age of 17 or 18 and having to make career choices at the age of 17 or 18 because to go into the chartered accounting profession here you've got to have gone through university and done effectively an accounting qualification. I'm not sure if that's still the case but it certainly was when I came here and I'm finding with a lot of the youth of today, and I'm seeing this with uh, some of my kids, uh, they go into something and then realise it's not what they want to do mm -hmm. uh, and have to then change, whereas to me, if you just do what you enjoy, then it will lead to the right places. But if you enjoy doing chemistry, as I did at the time, <coughs> and realised that it wasn't going to be the career for me, but it was certainly something that I was passionate about, passionate about, but actually used it as being a tertiary qualification and all of the insight that comes with it and the, the grow, growing up that comes with it to use it to advance myself in a career in a totally different field. So what took you from chartered accounting to property? <clears throat> well we came here in 1987, I was on a two year contract with Price Waterhouse. Uh, I left after a year and I'd always uh, seen ultimately that uh, training in accounting was a, a means to an end, not an end in itself. Uh, basically, when I was uh, finishing university and looking at what I wanted to do, uh, I looked around uh, who was in charge of the big organisations uh, at the time in England, and it looked like most of them had accounting qualifications. So uh, the more research I did, the more I saw that that was a, a passport to business, whatever business might mean. And I never knew what business actually meant, but it, you know, it's, it, being involved in commerce and actually doing something uh, appealed to me, uh, not denigrating professional accounting, but being in the profession uh, as a long-term career, I don't think was ever really an option for me. Uh, and uh, now I stumbled into the property industry by accident uh, because uh, I was getting itchy feet and uh, it turned out there was a, uh, a Perth self-made entrepreneurial person uh, uh, who uh, was looking for somebody to bring into the business with financial accounting qualifications uh, who he said you know to train as a businessman and I mean I suppose I could have he could have been in mining or energy or sheep farming or anything else uh, and maybe I would have stayed in that industry as long as I had but maybe not but one of the things that I quickly recognised that appealed to me out of this industry is that we actually do something tangible 
uh, leave a legacy. And if we do it the right way, they are things where 10 or 20 years later you can drive past and be proud of it and do something tangible that actually creates product that people can enjoy over many years. Well, you joined Stockland in 1999, and we'll yes. come back to that period since as we uh, progress. But uh, let's talk about the housing affordability crisis. Uh, what are the factors that make housing in Australia particularly expensive? Uh, it's a very, very difficult concept to work through. <coughs> um, it's called supply and demand. Hmm. And I think it's been around for a few thousand years now as a concept. And it comes down to the fact that we have three layers of government who are all pulling in opposite directions. Uh, and demand is created by the federal government. Demand is created through population growth because housing is a factor of population growth. If we had no population growth, we would, we would need a limited amount of new housing. <coughs> because of dilapidation and renovation and people wanting to do things smarter. Uh, but because of population growth, we need a lot of new housing. 160,000 a year uh, is the, the common uh, number that's used based on population growth that we have today. That population growth is driven by the federal government and it's driven in two ways. Firstly, through its, the tax policy, which through the Costello era actually drove a higher natural increase of population. Uh, remember Peter Costello saying, have one for mum, one for dad, and one for the country? Not that that made that much difference. Well, we've had four, so we actually had a couple for the country, just to show how... Maybe I'm, I've got dual citizenship, maybe it was one for each. Um, and it has made a difference. The fertility rate in Australia actually has gone up as a result of that. That's only a small part of it, though. The bigger part is obviously through immigration. And despite all of the rhetoric and talk about boat people and refugees, there is bipartisan support... Uh, for immigration that will result in Australia having population growth of 330,000 people a year or one and a half percent, which is very healthy. The issue then comes though with the fact that this, the federal government don't drive supply. They leave that to the states through their metropolitan planning schemes and state planning schemes to drive supply. And up until recently, nobody's had the foresight to add up everything that the states do with supply and see if it equals the 160,000 of demand that the federal government is providing. It gets worse because the states, in a lot of cases, don't have the approval rights for the development on the ground unless they call it in, which is a very unpopular thing to do. So the approval is actually given by the local authority, of which there are 542. And no, nobody definitely adds up everything that's approved by the local authority to see if you get to 160,000. <clears> so as a result of that, particularly in recent times, uh, we've seen a situation where demand has significantly outstripped supply and therefore prices have gone up. And well, people have had to give more and more of their disposable income into paying for housing because of uh, that uh, imbalance between supply and demand. Well, as a key property, property developing company, what, what of those factors holds you up the most? Uh, of all of those factors? Mm. Well, population growth doesn't hold us up. I mean, it, it just happens, and it's uh, a very proactive policy that the government has its skills based. Population growth that's unplanned for might. Oh, well, it might, but it, the population growth is actually planned for, and it's skills based migration, which means that. People are coming here for a reason, and people are coming here to add to the economic value of the country and the prosperity of the country. The biggest issue is our inability to provide them with affordable housing because of rigidity in the planning system and the fact that there is too much red tape and too much uh, of a potentially anti-development feeling at the grassroots level, which then translates it into local government and state policy which is driven about uh, how can we stop things happening rather than how can we make things happen. So population growth and development have become dirty words when we can't afford them to be dirty words if that means that we're going to deny the new people coming in and the existing people access to affordable housing. To what extent is tax policy also a factor in? It's, it is a factor to some extent uh, and it is a driver in this but it's not, it's not the massive driver uh, that uh, uh, supply and demand fundamentally is. The where, where tax comes into it, I mean, negative gearing is, is one issue, uh, but 
it, it is here and it's here to stay so we have to uh, have to live with that I think if tax policy was to be developed from the and if we were to start again certainly the Henry review said that we would start again probably without that but we do have it and it actually does help the increase of, of rental stock mm. where tax comes into it though is that the governments have made a conscious decision particularly at the state level and the local level that they have to raise revenue obviously to pay for what they do and that it's better for them to raise revenue by taxing the new people coming into the system rather than spreading the load over the existing system so for example by our research and that through the housing industry association and the property council the government impost through tax levies and so forth of a new home across the country is somewhere in the order of 25 to 40 percent of the cost of a new home whereas uh, the governments could actually have that as a lower cost and spread it above the existing rate base and it's not just the cost of the new home that's the the issue in the tax on that it, it tends to be that people who are moving into newer greenfield areas are not just paying the burden of an increased impost of tax on their new home that their forebears didn't have uh, they also have to pay for the tolls on the roads whereas people in existing areas get those roads for, for free uh, and there's more fee for service and pay, for pay as you go uh, so it's not just a factor of housing it's all of the other imposts that come with it as well. So it's a complicated story uh, has the industry itself been spectacularly unsuccessful in re-engineering the way things are? Uh, to some extent yes but we are learning at a rapid rate of knots because <clears throat> we've, re we've realised certainly as an organisation that affordability is a and meeting affordability is a critical success factor because if you don't make your product affordable then people won't buy it, it's as simple as that and we had a period up until the uh, global financial crisis where uh, we could get away with the wrong product because people would just pay more and put themselves into more debt to buy that product. Even if fundamentally they couldn't afford it, the banks would lend them the money and they would take on the debt and worry about it later. Well, later uh, came. People have realised that now and they've realised that they should be spending money on what they need rather than spending money on what they would previously have uh, aspired to. So everybody's expectations are coming down. And uh, if you have the product that's too expensive, the only way that you can sell it is by dropping the price. Whereas if you change the product to make it smaller, then we're effectively dropping the price through product innovation rather than by effectively discounting and putting ourselves out of business. There are counter trends, of course. Consumers have got their own uh, particular view about what they want in housing. And in 2009, I think the Australian Bureau of Stats released figures indicating that Australians were now building the largest floor area homes in the world. That's correct, uh, on a per capita basis. Everything to do with these uh, statistics should come back to a per capita basis, a per person basis. It's the same as the overall sustainability metrics. I mean, one of the, uh, uh, the, the nuances of, of sustainability is that the, the most sustainable building, the most energy efficient building, is one that is empty. Um, but it's actually not because it means those people are somewhere else. And everything should be done on a per capita basis because it's ultimately humans that consume uh, everything, uh, energy included. And uh, as they pointed out quite rightly, that uh, on a per capita basis, Australia then, and still, even though it's coming down a bit, was building new homes at the rate of 83 square metres per person. So 250 square metre house, three people, 83 square metres And this per was person. something like a third larger than 20 years ago? Uh, it was, and also from an international perspective, uh, the UK, for example, is 35. Now, it's one of the reasons I moved here, because I was brought up in a house that was uh, three of us and probably 100 square metres. Uh, we had a cat, but it got decapitated when I swung it. Um, and <laughs> it's one of the reasons I came here. It's not saying that... Uh, it's only a joke, by the way. The, we didn't, <laughs> the, cat, the cat actually lived till she was 18. The... Uh, the but, and I'm not saying we should go to that density of housing or that smallness of housing, but 83 square metres per person is just massive. And I think we've got to learn from the fact that it's not that necessarily our houses are too expensive, it's that they're too large. And on a per square metre basis, on a per capita basis, 
that's the real rate metric that we need to, uh, to attack. On a per square metre basis, houses in Australia are actually not that much more expensive than international standards. It's just that they're much larger. We need to, we need to live with less. Well, back in 2007, you made decisions in a corporate sense to actually offer more affordable housing in, with lower floor areas and, and other attributes. Um, so you were actually working against the trend. We were at that time, and we actually started our affordability strategy before the global financial crisis. We actually started it, I remember it was in uh, March 2007 when interest rates went up and affordability just vanished. And we said to ourselves, we, we have to take control of our own destiny here, because if we don't, we will not be able to sell our product. It will just become more and more expensive and people won't be able to afford it. But we realised at the time that it was a, an education process that we would have to take people on because people had been conditioned to a certain style of behaviour. Uh, and I remember, and the builders as well, I remember uh, when we tried to move from a four-bedroom house to a three-bedroom house, the builders were, we're not doing that because we only build four-bedroom houses, our brand is too valuable, we can't do three-bedroom houses. Uh, so a first homeowners might be only two people or two people with one child. Uh, they were conditioned to thinking they needed a four-bedroom house. Um, people would say, well, I have to have a four-bedroom house. I can't have three bedrooms because otherwise I'll be too embarrassed to have my friends around for dinner because I've only got three bedrooms. I mean, it was conditioned into the psyche. It's a risky business trying to educate the market. Well, it, it was, but this is where, I mean, every cloud has a silver lining uh, where the global financial crisis actually changed behaviour overnight. Uh, we actually thought that this would be a four- to five-year evolution uh, of changing behaviour when the global financial crisis changed it overnight because people said, well, I've got a choice here. I can have more debt or I can have my life back. Uh, and they're making a trade-off that an extra bedroom will cost them so much more in debt uh, or a movie room will cost them much, so much more in debt or do I have to have it now or can I start small and build my way up? Which is historically what we did. Mm. I mean, I remember my uh, first house was very, very small. There were only two of us, so why did we need a big house? Whereas people almost jumped straight from renting into the third house and didn't do the transition on the way through. And I think people have now changed and they're saying, well, it's actually all right after all. Uh, it's smaller, it's uh, more affordable, and guess what? I still get stone bench tops and nice down lighting, so what's the big deal here? And it's, I'm not putting myself in debt. So how big a shift was this? Uh, you started offering house and land packages for $300,000. Yeah, well, in, just in raw terms, in the last five years, the average size of the land that we are developing and selling has dropped by 30%. So we, our product has become, in land size, 30% more. So what's efficient. traded off for that? Uh, a, a smaller house and less debt, but a more efficient house. And smaller land area, obviously. Smaller land area. Now, uh, but in a lot of cases, the buyers will say, well, uh, I'm not getting the big backyard, but hang on, do I really want that? Because uh, up until recently in Melbourne, you couldn't water it anyway, and it looked like a, a dust bowl. People are entertaining differently. Uh, they are bringing up their children differently. They want more access to public open space. Uh, relaxation in the backyard is more about the the, the informal eating out area at the uh, at the back. Uh, so when we have a uh, a package that we'll put out that we'll have you know we'll throw in an outdoor entertaining built-in barbecue area that will be very successful for us because that's the kind of lifestyle that people are now looking for. Uh, people are you know a lot in a lot of cases sick of every uh, Sunday uh, the they're uh, time poor and they've got to spend two hours mowing the lawn. Do they really need that? and for every square metre they're not buying, that's $500 that they're saving. One of the biggest, we talked before about planning and the difficulty in achieving this, and some of the uh, legacy planning issues that we're dealing with uh, need to be overhauled because they are preventing us from making the changes that we need to make. Uh, there is still, for example, even on smaller land lots, 90% uh, of the product that is developed is single storey which single-storey housing is the biggest waste of, of land. A lot of it's to do with the fact that people have been conditioned, that everybody's had a single storey previously, that's what we've got to have, and double-storey housing is negative because you've got to go up and down the stairs. But they actually work, work a lot better in terms of the flow of where people sleep and where people 
uh, uh, eat and, and so on. Um, and I think growingly that people will uh, will be attuned to that. But the cost import of having double story with some of the issues around scaffolding and so on, they sound like very, very simple issues, but that probably adds $20,000 to the cost of a house. So Matthew, paint the big picture in terms of what the corporation's doing. In 2009, you sort of refocus away from office and industrial to what you call three R's, residential, retirement and uh, retail. So the housing shift that we've been talking about, is that a small piece of the total puzzle? No, not at all. It's a big piece, uh, but it's a shift that we're seeing in every part of our business. Uh, in retirement living, for example, uh, we are decreasing the, uh, the house size in retirement living so that it's more affordable for people when they, uh, they age to uh, uh, have you know, effectively more cash in their hand when they move from their house into a retirement village because they need to downsize and they're looking to downsize, but they're looking to downsize more effectively and more efficiently. And if we look at uh, house designs, retirement unit designs now compared with five years ago, they are significantly more efficient uh, than, they, than they were, less corridors and much more efficient space. In, uh, in retail, we're actually uh, positioning ourselves in the market uh, for customers and offering them products and services that are based on day-to-day -day needs rather than aspiration uh, because there has been a seismic shift in consumer behaviour away from spending things on discretion of what you know they are choosing to have from an aspirational perspective to day-to-day -day needs. There are, there are trade-offs that people are making where they will put a lot more value on uh, private education than you know, having expensive clothes in the wardrobe. Uh, these are the trade-offs that people are making. It's much now about the family and actually having the right legacy for the family and the right education, the right access to uh, health and services. So we are moving deliberately away from higher-end fashion uh, and the like into more day-to-day -day value and convenience and, and responding to the, uh, the changing consumer behaviour. Michael Porter of Harvard Business School, of course, uh, developed the idea of creating shared value, which Stockland has embraced. Uh, to what extent is the corporate strategy related to creating shared value? Well, probably a lot, but I don't really know what it means. I haven't read it. Uh, and I mean, our, our view of these things is that uh, it's got to be you know, in your blood. Uh, you shouldn't have to read about these concepts and follow them. You haven't read them. Pardon? You haven't read it? Uh, not that particular one, I haven't, no. Uh, but I can imagine what it might mean. Uh, and I think it comes down to the fact, I think, that people have perceived that owner returns or shareholder returns and community returns and customer returns are mutually exclusive, that they're all competing with each other. Whereas to me, they're not. They're all aligned. The only difference between them is the time horizon that the organisation needs to take. And if the organisation is patient enough and can take a longer term time horizon, then the value that crea is created for the community and the customers will ultimately reflect in value for the organisation as a whole and for the, uh, the shareholder. There are obvious strains there and tensions between the shareholder and the stakeholder. I mean, I think, for example, the most obvious uh, to me is that the banks, the banks put up interest rates, it may actually increase the bank's returns to its shareholders, but yeah. it won't actually make its stakeholders or borrowers particularly happy. So, uh, realistically speaking, these things don't live in harmony. Well, th they may not, and there might be short-term conflicts uh, between them, but in the longer term, uh, then, then absolutely they do. I mean, if you... And, but some of, the, some of the concepts actually sound a bit trite when you, when you say them. Uh, for example, in, in re our retirement living business, uh, there are two sayings we have to drive behaviour. Uh, the first is what we call the mum test. Would you be happy with your mum living there? If not, Fair then, question. <laughs> if not, then why not? And what are we doing about that? Because if you're not happy for your mum to live there, why are you going to ask somebody else's mum to do that instead. So it means that there's a, a quality of the physical presence and the quality of, of, of service that we provide that dictates uh, uh, their behaviour 
of the people that, that we have, which may in the short term come at a higher cost. So the idea of shared value is inherent in that question, the Correct. mum test question. And the, the second is, uh, test is that the definition of success or the sign of ultimate success in that business, as it is with all of them, is what we call our residents voice survey, which is an annual survey of resident happiness and engagement. Are they happy living in our villages? And the last three years we've had a positive, you know, yes or uh, very much so of uh, 89%, which is probably as high as we'd ever want to be. If we chase 100%, you know, we're not going to always make everybody happy. There's a law of diminishing returns that comes in after that. Now, in the short term, uh, we could put less money in, less amenity, you know, smaller swimming pool, no gym, charge them more for the coffee in the canteen uh, and would be at 70%, but in the short term we might make more money, but in the longer term we would lose. What we've got to do is actually be focused on generating that happiness and that customer engagement, taking a longer term view, and those returns will, will come to us. Obviously big stakeholders are your uh, employees. What are you doing to actually engage them? Well. Really, it's, I think that, again, these things are aligned because, and one of the good things about our industry, and it's why I'm in this business, is that if you actually make your customers happy, it's, it's a big happiness. Uh, you know, and I'm not, I'm not putting down uh, retail, for example, but uh, if you make somebody happy in a shop because you've given them good service, uh, you know, they feel good about buying you know, the towels or the microwave that they bought. You make somebody good about buying their home, particularly for first home buyers who are 30% of our sales, you go home at night with a real positive sense of achievement. You know, what have you done today? You've actually got somebody into home ownership who deserves to be there in an affordable way that they like. And there's a great sense of achievement and engagement that comes out of that uh, for, for our people. Um, we opened a, uh, a, a stage of our new retail development at Shell Harbour uh, uh, last week and uh, one of the retailers we've been able to attract there is RM Williams. For the local population, I mean that's like, you know, awesome for them. They don't have to drive uh, two hours to get to Sydney. Um, you know, they are so pleased with what we've done and the letters that come in from the, the shoppers of how pleased they are with us. Um, and uh, the mayor, uh, the local mayor, actually gave uh, the opening for us. And, and you know, we don't have any political donations. We stopped that years ago, but you'd think that we did because we got the biggest commendation you could ever get. Um, that's where the employee engagement and the employee uh, happiness comes out of by creating these things and seeing people enjoy them. What's your sustainability agenda? Well, I'm, it, it's not a uh, you know, a charter on a page or something that we could read out. It's basically to do those kind of things. If, uh, uh, if you, I mean, our purpose as an organisation is to create a better way to live, and our sustainability agenda, as as is all of our agenda, is built built on that, uh, and actually, you know, leaving a legacy that we're going to be very, very proud of, that we can hold our heads high and say we've done the right thing. Now, it's not always easy for an industry like ours where there's a whole uh, host of people who, who think that we're chopping down trees and polluting rivers and, and the like, which is uh, absolutely not the case. Uh, so to actually talk about development and changing the landscape from a sustainable perspective is not an easy thing to do. It's a very hard message to get across. But it has to be part of what we do because if we don't do it, then... Uh, we won't be successful in the future. I imagine the sustainable way involves costs in very many instances. Uh, can you give us an example of where you've actually faced a difficult choice and you've gone for the more expensive but the more sustainable way? The, there are many examples and uh, we actually uh, uh, pull them together each year in a sustainability report. Um, and. We, we do that because everybody's just doing them anyway and then at the end of the year we have to report on them uh, but people just get on and do it in any case so there would be instances happening today where people would be making that value judgment uh, most of which I wouldn't know what they were but I know they'll be making that value judgment because they're empowered to do that 
So what are they empowered actually to do? What in what, what is the value? What is the value judgment? Well, there is there are some things where it, it costs us nothing, because it's just better stakeholder engagement uh, first and foremost. And actually, having engagement with the local community to explain what we're doing and why we're doing it, and show the sustainable approach that we're taking. So a lot of it is actually just explaining what we're doing in any case, because people probably underestimate what we do just as an ordinary course of business. Uh, where we go over and above uh, in doing things that will uh, build a much more sustainable community for the future it may cost a bit of money now, uh, but uh, we'll get the long-term payback. For example, in our uh, retirement villages, just coming back to that example, uh, one of the rules that we have is that the, the clubhouse, which will ultimately service, say, 250 uh, units, about 400 people, uh, we have that open as part of stage one, uh, rather than leaving it till the end when it's economic, because we want people to be engaged from the start. Forty percent of our sales in retirement living actually come from resident referral. Now, if we can get that to fifty percent by having the better infrastructure on the ground, uh, then we're going to make more sales, uh, and it's actually building something that's better for the local community from the start. In uh, in our residential business. Uh, we pride ourselves by having shops on the ground earlier than our competitors. Now, the rate of return that we're making on those shops, and we're building them in a very sustainable way. I mean, we, we actually uh, were the first to develop a, a Green Star uh, rating for retail. Didn't have one up until three or four years ago. We actually created it ourselves with the, uh, the Green Building Council and the, and the Property Council. So we're building these to a very high level of uh, social and environmental sustainability. Uh, but getting things on the ground sooner. Uh, the rate of return on the retail centre itself is below par, but the overall impact on the sales and engagement we have with the broader community in making more residential sales means that our total return is significantly higher. Around issues like shared value and sustainability, there is the challenge of actually developing adequate metrics to measure progress, yeah. and, and mm. you're involved in that. Well, we are, and I think ultimately... Uh, with technology, everything is going to get measured because technology means that there is just going to be nowhere to hide. Uh, who would have thought 20 years ago that you would have a My School website? Now, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it means that there is total transparency of what's going on in the school and parents can actually log in and actually see what's happening and make a value judgment about education and ultimately where they would send their kids uh, to go to school. Uh, my, f my feeling and my view is, is that uh, ultimately that measurement tool will apply to a whole host of, uh, of, of different things uh, from where it is now. If we take the uh, community one, for example, community wellbeing, uh, there is no doubt in my mind that there will be uh, measurements in place and tools in place in the future that will measure community wellbeing down to uh, crime, uh, domestic violence, suicide rate, alcoholism, unemployment, whatever it might be, and that areas will get will have this kind of rating tool or this transparency where people will actually say, well, I want to go and live there because look at this. You talk about that as being mostly in the future. Well, it's happening now. We're actually developing this measurement tool as we speak. But it's not about... Uh, the physical measurement of the space. Uh, if I go back 10 or 15 years when our industry was trying to do this before, <coughs> it was based on, on planning as the primary driver rather than community wellbeing. So I remember having conversations 10, 15 years ago, and it would be about uh, we want uh, all of the houses uh, to have uh, a maximum of 400 metre walk to the shops, walkability. And that all sounded well and good, made sense. But now we'd ask ourselves the question, well, uh, what's the point in that if the shops, when you get there, are terrible and you're going to get mugged when you walk there? This, this is more about the, the intangibles of the well-being that happen within the community, not the physical and spatial things. And I think this is where planning in the past has actually driven the spatial outcomes without, without actually recognising the social outcomes that come with it. Uh, as well. Do market analysts give a damn about this? About some sustainability? Do. Yes, some do. I, I was uh, in London. Some do. 
I was in London recently, a growing number in fact. Uh, I was in London recently uh, meeting with one of the big, one of the biggest global fund managers, I won't mention their name, and they were uh, talking to me about this, about what we're doing, because they are looking to invest in companies that are ahead of the curve, because they realise themselves the nexus between sustainability and shareholder value in the future. Now, they are at this end of the spectrum. There are some who are uh, taking a tick-the-box ESG. I can only invest if you tick these things. Uh, so they're looking at the metrics rather than what's actually happening. And there are some who, who don't care. Uh, and I respect all of them because they've all got a different investment philosophy. It's not that anybody's right or anybody's wrong. But over time, you can see everything moving in this direction because people are going to see the connection between taking a long-term approach and a more sustainable approach and long-term shareholder value. You've come a long way. What do you see as future priorities in terms of sustainability? Well, I think the, the, the biggest priority is, is having courage and conviction uh, about this because there are times when uh, we all come under a lot of pressure to be more short term. If you look at our company's performance over the last uh, 12 months, the share price performance, it's been dismal. Uh, and it's uh, somewhat to do with our exposure to the housing market. It's been going through a downturn. Uh, some questions on some of the things that we're, that we're doing. Uh, it would be easy in times like that to react to it and say, well, we need to do something more dramatic to improve that, uh, cut costs, get rid of all of the fluffy stuff we've been doing and increase short-term returns. Uh, and yes, we could do that, but fundamentally it would not be the right thing to do. There might be a short-term kick that comes out of it, but we'd be destroying the fabric of the organisation and actually denying future shareholders what will be significant value that we'll, we will be uh, creating for them. So I think the biggest priority and the biggest challenge is actually having courage to withstand that short-term pressure. And I know I'm not alone in, in saying that. It's, uh, it's, it's an issue for a lot of chief executives and a lot of boards, mar marrying, marrying up that short-term pressure with the, the long-term horizon that, uh, that we should be having. Matthew Quinn, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure.